So let's go to the topic of today, purple teaming. So what is purple teaming? What's the whole idea? I can already hear you think, but Eric, we have a red team. We don't even have a blue team. How are we going to start handling a third team, a purple team? Well, the whole point is that both the red team and the blue teams, although they have an offense and defensive mindset, they all work together towards the same common goal, which is to improve your organization's security posture. So what we have is uh, at the offense side, you typically have your vulnerability assessments, penetration tests, social engineering, all considered to be red team. While at the blue team side, you have implementation of controls, security monitoring, some incident response even. So all of that same goal is to make the organization more secure. But that doesn't always work as planned. So I've had quite some experience in red teams before because I used to be a full-time pen tester. Now I do more and more of the blue team side of things. They share a common goal, but often in organizations, even the way they're set up politically doesn't mean or doesn't encourage them to work together. For example, if a red team reports a lot of vulnerabilities, that's a job well done. They've done their work. The success that they have or the success that they get is measured by the number of failed controls from the blue team which means that they are not really incentivized to help the blue team, because why would they? I have seen cases where red teams refuse, blatantly refuse to share their techniques because they're looking at, okay, but this is what we do and this is our way in. So we like to keep that. So they don't always want to share what they're doing with the blue team, which is of course nonsense. And that's something that we need to look at. We need to look at how can we make them work better together. So it's not really a third team. I don't think it should be a third team in your organization. Um, it could be something more of a, how do you make the red and blue teams work together? And how do you make sure you get sufficient value from both teams? Um, that brings me to my last point on, on this subject is the feedback loop. Uh, this is an important one. And Steve already touched upon that uh, very shortly. So what typically happens now is you've got your red team or your pen testers come in, they walk into the environment, they do their thing. So they do their analysis, they provide a report, they write a whole bunch of issues and vulnerabilities that they found, but then they leave, right? Because they're done. That's the work that they do. Usually what they get, they get some feedback from the blue team on remediated flaws, but that's usually where it ends. Imagine, for example, I know a lot of organizations who do yearly pen tests. So every year they get the third party in to do a pen test because, well, maybe compliance because they have to. So they get a pen test in, uh, they come in, they do the pen test, and one year later, they get another pen test. But how often do we see the same type of issues come back again and again and again? because the feedback loop is way too long because there's one pen test, it takes a year. <laughs> and after that, there's another pen test. But what about getting the red team in to do the pen test and a week after, once they've reported, already get them to talk to the blue team to see, okay, but how is this going? So the red team could share the TTPs of new actors that they see with the blue team. So indicating, okay, but these are the new techniques that are being used by both pen testers, but also by real adversaries to compromise your environment. The red team could also help out with vulnerability management. That doesn't mean, doesn't mean they should be uh, installing patches because that's a step too far, but they could help them prioritize. They could tell the blue team, okay, guys, but these are the big ones. These are the ones that we're using to get in. So these are the big ones you need to get rid of. But the other side works as well. So the blue team could even share their uh, monitoring tactics, how they're doing monitoring with the red team. So they could say, hey guys, we see you doing X, Y, Z because we have monitoring controls in place for that. So if you want to step up your game and try other stuff, uh, this is what we're already monitoring. So those are things that can work because that will increase the level of the red team, which will in turn again increase the level of the blue team. And that's how you keep on growing. So in the end, it all boils down to the offense must inform defense. And of course, defense must inform offense. So that's a, a big thing, uh, making sure that that uh, is done right. So this is really what we're aiming for with SEC 599. And that's also why we mentioned that we are not just a blue team course where we only focus on defense, because what we want to avoid is to be too theoretical on this is a control you need to implement. No, we want to make it very clear. This is the attack. This is how it works. And this is why you need to implement that control. And this is how you do it. Right? So we want to show the offensive side. We want to show the defensive side. But the goal, of course, is to make things better. So that's why we are trying to position ourselves into that purple team spectrum, where we're trying to help organizations understand what the issues are and then help them to defend against them. So let's take an example. Um, so if we discuss lateral movement, for example, which is a key section of the course, we are discussing how users or how attackers are stealing credentials from one system and are reusing them against others. One of the most infamous tools there is, of course, Mimikatz, which is being used to dump credentials, uh, from, for example, from the ELSAS process. 
So one of the things that we look at in the first section of that lab would be, okay, let's dump credentials from the ELSOS uh, process. So you get credentials, you steal them, and then you reuse them against another system. So you do a couple of hops like that. You could use Bloodhound as well, see where to go, uh, how do you get through the environment, how do you pivot to finally get to the main admin, and you see the impact firsthand. Then we discuss, okay, but what went wrong here? What, what is Mimikatz doing? How does it get those credentials? We also explain the control. So we have Windows 10 Credential Guard, for example, which by no means defeats Mimikatz completely, but it does something really well, which is the isolation of the ELSAS process. So we look at how it does that, why it is effective, and why it can be used in your organization. Then we will implement that control in the lab environment that we have available. So you implement the control, and you retry as a third step, you retry the same attack, and you'll see that it actually gets blocked. Or if you fail to implement properly, it doesn't get blocked. <laughs> but the whole point is we show you how effective the control is. So that helps to drill down the point and to make it very clear to people, this is why you need to implement that control and make it very, it, it's, it's very clear, it's very concrete, it's very practical and very hands-on.